Okay, so hey everyone, um, it's currently 3.30 uh, a.m. in the morning, and I spent all day making the uh, die-encoded GTS 2Ms. They should be on the site now. Um, all outstanding orders will be shipped tomorrow. I'm clearing everything out. That's my music. I'm clearing everything out so that it'll finish up by Tuesday, which is tomorrow. And uh, I'm leaving for New York on Wednesday. So hopefully everything should ship, and I do have the ability to ship from in transit, so when I'm in New York. So um, I'm going to be in the cubicle working with some cool stuff, we'll see what's up, and uh, hopefully have some cool news for everyone. Um, but for two weeks I won't be here to do Angstrom, it is holiday season, um, so we'll see what's up. Uh, the store will reopen in January. So, new year, new products, new cool things. I am working with uh, the tile project. Let's see if I have it around here. Um, so these are tiles on the cube. And uh, the way it's going to work is I'm going to... There's a chemical that is commonly used in industry that can weld two plastics together. So old tiles had the issue of peeling up in the corners and then stabbing you. What if I made, what if I invented a press that somehow automatically perfectly aligned everything combined with chemical welding? So um, with a few secrets, I can make it so that this welding compound goes around the tile and will fuse the tile permanently into the plastic. So what you have is like this little textured plastic tile. It's soft polycarbonate, uh, and uh, it's a little dirty, but it has a light, a mild texture to it. And these tiles, since they're part of the plastic, they'll never come off. So if you chip stickers or you miss the old CubeSmith tiles, these are better than the CubeSmith tiles, and I'm gonna bring them back. So that's gonna come up in the future. Um, so there's gonna be a lot of a lot of cool things coming in 2008. I've played with the idea of coding big cubes. Uh, people who have coded 3x3s should be getting them like today. Um, so that's Angstrom news. So enough for updates. Um, I'm going to tell everyone about um, what the Angstrom name started out as. So it's story time now. So let's say uh, a long time ago, um, I was a PhD student. I was studying medicinal organic chemistry. and. Uh, one of the men I respected the most of all my professors was also my advisor. Uh, he was giving a lecture about how inside the protein of, uh, I forget which, which species it was, but there was a protein. And inside that protein, it bonded in its active site to other proteins and things to the substrate. And within that active site, it was only the margin of a few angstroms that meant the difference between life and death. And an angstrom is such a tiny, tiny, infinitesimally small measure of distance. And it's crazy how just a few of those angstroms can really alter everything inside that protein, which alters everything inside that organ, which alters everything inside that living being. And it struck me as so profound that such a tiny difference could make such a, such a tiny distance could make such a big difference. And, um, I really respected him. He he helped me out a lot, and I wanted to honor that memory by calling this new shop Angstrom Research. Um, I miss it sometimes, but bad things happen in life, and I'm back in school for a different degree and different program now. Um, and to end this video, uh, a lot of people are wondering. Uh, I've heard a lot of misinformation out there. Um, I'm going to explain boron treatment. Only for educational purposes, I'm going to tell you all the dangerous steps so you don't do these things, and boron treatment was just too inconsistent, it was expensive, and the results weren't as great as polymer coating or dye coating. And since now it's obsolete, I'm going to tell you everything. So uh, I'm surprised no one really researched deep enough. This was the 1979 Nobel Pri Prize in Chemistry um, by a professor named Brown. Um, if you go to the Nobel Prizes, you can read into it, and it's in full detail. 
and I'm also doing this from memory so there's a big chance I'm gonna have mistake this so there are a lot of ways to convert double bonds into different things but the classic boro hydroboration oxidation reaction is cheap it is uh, mild non-poisonous so you, you can't sell uh, I'm a chemist I have a degree in it you can't sell things that are toxic or dangerous or expensive because they're the bad things so everything that is chemistry related that's being sold from cubicle labs or angstrom research it's safe um, the hydroboration oxidation process has all of those features um, so let's get started you have to have a base a few basic core concepts um, firstly you have to work out your solvent system if you use straight up THF you're gonna instantly dissolve the cube and it's gonna be useless you have to figure out a solvent system that is um, a product it doesn't protonate it's not acidic uh, it relatively a product it is uh, aqueous but not too aqueous um, for the workup step uh, it doesn't have to be aqueous but it also can't be it can't have water in it because if you have water with the boron agent uh, it's gonna be a bad time uh, a really really bad time because you also have to work in the uh, hydrogen peroxide and things so with the hydrogen peroxide in aqueous solution you have to be very careful um, again this is from memory so I might miss miss a few steps um, but yes so the solvent system I used was 65% uh, methanol 35% THF And that's because with the majority methanol and the minority THF, uh, the methanol plays well with the THF. You can get it really dry. It can buy it in almost lab grade. Uh, throw some uh, four angstrom mole sieves, angstrom again. Throw some molecular sieves in there, and it'll dry out the solution. Um, you don't really want to. Uh, you don't want to not. You don't want to distill THF because it can get explosive if it's old. So the best way to dry it out, relatively dry, is to use molecular sieves. Um, and these things are pretty expensive. Um, if you're using 65% methanol, 35% THF, you can keep the cube in there much longer and it won't instantly dissolve. Because the chemical reaction takes a lot of time to progress from uh, start to finish. And if you just instantly take it out after it's been in there for like a tiny bit of time, nothing's gonna happen you have to keep it in there until the chemical reaction is done so as for the actual reaction you have to think about a catalyst so the THF does partially catalyze the borane but you're gonna need more what you're gonna need is a Lewis acid um, Lewis acids are generally metal ions and what you want to do is coordinate the boron so that it's more active coordinated boron it um, most things with catalyst catalysts and coordination become more powerful and the catalyst isn't consumed in the reaction so you only have to add a little bit my catalyst of choice was aluminum chloride hexahydrate and you might ask if it's a hexahydrate there's water in there there are a few other solutions and if you don't have molecular sieves what you can do is just overload it with boron the boron will consume some of the water and the reaction will proceed um, that works too and for this you just add a little bit just a little little bit to get the reaction going all it does is coordinate the boron and you you get some cool color changes so as for the boron compound everyone's asking there are so many compounds that you can use. The cheapest one is sodium borohydride. Careful buying this, kids, if you choose to do this. It is illegal in multiple countries because it is, as a reducing agent, you can use it to make drugs, which you should never, ever, ever do. Um, and as a result, uh, you may have trouble buying this. Um, there are other agents available. This one's just the simplest, cheapest, and safest. Um, safe is a relative term it does release hydrogen gas which is explosive don't use this around flame 
and in certain conditions it is very dangerous. Uh, so, sodium borohydride. Um, a lot of reactions, they say that sodium borohydride won't work. You have to use a stronger boron compound. Um, empirically speaking, in the lab, once you get once you do actual chemistry, sometimes you just have to hit it hard enough. If you hit the reaction with a high enough concentration with the right conditions, borohydride is a much more powerful reagent than uh, the textbooks make it say. And that's just from empirical lab, lab experience. Um, so what else is next? THF. Uh, you can also substitute diglime for THF, um, but that's more expensive and THF is cheap to use. Um, I'm, I feel like I'm missing something. I feel like, again, this is from memory. I haven't done this in months. Um, but you have your, sol your solvent system, your reagent, you have your catalyst, and once you have it in your solution, uh, you, you mix it up a little bit. Um, you're gonna see color changes, you're gonna see foaming. Uh, that's when you know it's good. Uh, this reaction, you're gonna see a salt develop at the bottom. Don't worry, that, that's to be normal, that's to be expected. The, the salt at the bottom is uh, it's from the chloride from the aluminum chloride hexahydrate. Um, so that's no big deal. You're gonna see a lot of participate sometime. Uh, the big thing to keep in mind is eventually you, you wanna keep, you have some ice on hand because the reaction can get warm later when you add the base. So it's good to keep this reaction buffered at a slightly higher pH because at a lower pH, uh, protonation's gonna mess with things. You wanna keep this a little, um, little high pH. So throw in a little bit of the base. Uh, I used sodium hydroxide and uh, you just put in the Rubik's cubes. Um, if I remember correctly that should work. So um, then NaOH. Um, I don't remember the exact proportions. I used to play around with ratios. I can't remember what was the best. But after that you're gonna have to prepare the workup. So the reaction is called a hydroboration oxidation. Oxidation is the second step combined with the workup. So what you're going to use is sodium, not sodium, hydrogen peroxide. And this isn't the hydrogen peroxide you can buy at stores. Hydrogen peroxide that you buy at stores is like 2%. You're going to need like 30% or higher if you can but higher percentages are incredibly dangerous. Hydrogen peroxide of sufficient purity, if you get that on your skin, it will instantly fizzle and your skin will turn white and it's like a chemical burn. Um, it's an, actually an oxidation. Uh, hydrogen peroxide in pure, pure forms is actually strong enough to be rocket fuel. Um, it's, it comes like 40, per, 40 times stronger what you're gonna get in the grocery stores. You cannot use hydrogen peroxide from the grocery stores to do this reaction. So you're gonna need really high purity hydrogen peroxide and you're gonna mix that with the base. So more NaOH, sodium hydroxide. And for this reaction, for the workup, it's okay to do it in aqueous form. So it's okay to have water in the second part unlike the first part where you didn't have water. But for the first part, since you're working with borohydride, you want to keep liquid to a minimum. Methanol, dry methanol, molecular sieves, and over add the borohydride. Um, after this, you're going to do the workup. Uh, you may or may not see gas evolution. Um, then uh, keep it under the water as much as possible. You'll notice if the puzzle pieces are underwater, and not exposed to air, they'll slowly change color. And the way you get that nice, even marbled color and that luster, um, some of my uh, cubes I sent out to some people had this luster. Actually, I have one right here. Um, you'll see here, the piece is still very shiny. Uh, let's see. See how the light reflects off of it? Or, let's see if I can get this to focus. Do you see how the light reflects off this piece? Um, sometimes if you don't do this correctly and you keep it under, don't keep it under the water, it's going to get this weird 
coloring on top, that's because of solvent leaching. It's going to leach all the stuff on the inside on the outside, and you end up with a cube that feels not as smooth. So by keeping it in the workup, transferring it to like a bath of water to wash off the base, um, you can actually keep it on underwater overnight and then take it out because um, what you're doing is also the THF will soak into the plastic, but THF is also soluble in water. Um, over time, slowly, the THF will just go into the water, it'll leach different, and as it leaves the plastic slower, you get less distortion of the plastic. So the plastic will swell a little bit in the first step of the reaction. In the workup and leaving it in the water, cleaning it off, it'll get back down to its normal size, and by doing that as slow as possible, um, you can actually preserve a lot of the original shine of the puzzle. Uh, you want the puzzle to be smooth. Uh, smooth is good in Rubik's Cubes. Um, what else? Uh, when you're working with the base, the water can get really hot, so have some ice on hand just to cool your vessel. Um, if you are working with base, you can saponify the skin of your hand. So what that basically means is all the fats in your hand, you're going to turn them into soap. And your skin will be defatted because if you're putting this in organic solvent, such as step one, it's going to pull the fat out. And then if you work with base, it's going to convert all that fat to um, other stuff that you don't want it to convert to. Um, so hypothetically, if you did do this, there are so many things you have to keep in mind. You have to be very methodical, very careful. And with the things I've developed with polymer coating and dye coating, there's really no point anymore. Um, so that's pretty much it. If you just read into the 1979 uh, Nobel Prize, um, do things. So the plastic isn't just plastic. There are a lot of additives. The additives also, they might react. I never had characterization techniques, so I could never make sure. It was just really difficult to do with the funding that I had. Um, but it was a fun project and it led to a lot of productive things such as coating technology. See, coating has never would have happened without the original boron treatment. So research and development always, if you're on the right track, it'll lead you towards some more productive things. Um, again, this is just for educational value, don't actually do it. Um, but if you just read into the Nobel Prize for 1979, study up on the hydroboration oxidation reaction, and use the catalyst and the solvent system I mentioned. Uh, keep it in there for a long time because now with that right solvent system you're not going to melt the cube away. You might end up with something cool, but like I said, it was really inconsistent and unpredictable and expensive. So I hope that was fun to listen to. It's 18 minutes right now. Um, hopefully I'll have a video in New York. Um, that should be it. So See you guys next video.